Welcome to selfdiscoverymedia.com, where we discover the communities that are making a difference in the lives of others. Our self-discovery is something we are all making on our life's journey. Here you will find the people that will be your guidance, that will be your inspiration, that will be there for you in support on your journey of life. Do enjoy. Our next show is... Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. <clears throat> Welcome back to another edition of Building Your Business, which is also the business of your life. Right here on selfdiscoverymedia.com, I'm your host, Sarah Troy, and my wonderful repeat guest is Mark Singer. Last time we talked about retirement, you know, how, when to set up retirement, what is the retirement plan. He's president, president of the Safe Harbor Retirement Planning, and he's served as a relentless retirement guide to thousands of individuals since 1986. And the secret to his longevity has been asking the questions of other advisors, other advisors simply don't ask. So today, you know, we're going to be talking about the well, last time it was the Your Retirement Guide Seven Steps Retirement Planning System. And I do invite you to go back and listen to that because there's some wonderful nuggets there. But today is the impact on inflation on your social security, the impact um, that it takes on your social security with all this inflation, because inflation, let's face it, is inflatable inflation, <laughs> if you can have that, uh, when to take social security out and, and uh, how to navigate the new social security statement and, uh, you know, what is the best age to retire. So I think actually starting off with that bottom one, so many people don't retire. They just kind of pivot or change directions because there aren't very many people who can completely and utterly retire today. Is there? Welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you, sir. I really appreciate it. You know, it's interesting. AARP did a study a couple of years ago, and it indicated that for those who were approaching normal retirement, 65, 66, 67, that a vast majority of them were deferring their retirement. And the number one reason why they were deferring their retirement, they didn't have enough money. Right. And, you know, I say this over and over again. I think our industry has done a lousy job of educating people and preparing them for retirement. And I don't mean, oh my goodness, it's Friday, we're gonna retire Monday, that type of preparedness. We don't start them early enough mm -hmm. to get people financial literacy, financial education, financial awareness. I remember and this goes back a number of years ago. I was, I was speaking around the country on the topic of financial literacy. And I was in a room with a staffing organization. And, you know, it was the first time I realized I was old, right? <laughs> I, there were like seven mature, or eight. Mature, darling, there. mature. <laughs> was, thank you. Thank you. Was, I, there were like seven or eight people in there and they were all in their 20s. Mm. Oh, well, like, you are ancient will... to them, yes. Oh, my goodness, I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> so we start talking about stuff, and the comments they made across the board were in essence, and I paraphrase, gee, I wish somebody had told me about this when I was in college, when I was in high school. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate that we don't address these issues young enough um, and fortunately, corporations are embracing this a little bit more. Um, hopefully, it's unbiased, like it's not a product provider that is providing the information. Um, but I think that, you know, I, I talk a lot about um, starting early. <clears throat> you know, I, with my daughter and my granddaughter, I taught them about, you know, the power of starting early. When I say the industry's done us wrong, there was a series of uh, commercials done, must go back about 15, 18 years ago from one of the insurance companies. And it showed an individual with a yellow um, bar with a number on it under this person's arm walking with this, this looked like a gold bar, you know, like three or four feet long, $1,832,463. That was my retirement number. And he, was, he would walk along and he'd 
you know, he'd go into the bus and the bus would go on fire and his, his retirement number would go up or he'd go somewhere to get hits. You know, in other words, the fear of losing that money when you have. But that, that's not the message we need mm-hmm. to be saying to people. Because when I say to you, you need a million eight, 643 to retire, you go, I, I don't have that number. <laughs> exactly. I, I, I can't do that. Whereas, Are we in the twilight zone? Forget about it. <laughs> yeah. What we need to be telling people is $10 a week mm-hmm. when you're 22 years old can compound over a long period of time. We did a study and we did an analysis and and the numbers looked like this. If you started at the age of 20 and you put away $2,000 a year for eight years only versus waiting till the age of 28 and investing for 39 years at $2,000 a year, so to age 67, who would have more money, the person who invested $16,000 or the person who invested $78,000? Well, believe it or not, with a 9% rate of return and no guarantees for any future performance, but with a 9% rate of return, the person who started at age 20 and only put in $16,000 had $80,000 more than the person who waited eight years later. Mm -hmm. Einstein called it the eighth wonder of the world compounding. Mm -hmm. So if the, if the only message we can give ourselves, our kids, our grandkids is to just, it's the discipline of putting something away. You see a million eight, 643, you know, you got to put a thousand dollars a month away to get to it. If you don't start to, you know, at 45 or 50 or 55, nobody can do that. So we have to recalibrate the messaging so that it fits with our lifestyles so that we can wrap our heads around it. And this is where, again, just the industry has done it wrong. Yeah. I mean, you know, when you're in your 20s, it's you're building a career or it's, you know, it's the the day to day, the month to month job, you know, and you just just can I make my rent? You know, can I afford my car? You know, they're not even thinking about down the road. It's just survival in the now. Well, who wants to give up money today for a stranger 40 years from now? Right. right. Who want to do that. Yeah. We, I mean, we've all heard it as our friends get into their 50s and 60s. They go, oh, gosh, if I only knew then what I know now, if I'd only started earlier. Right. Everyone says yeah. that. It's a stitch in so, time, isn't it? You know, it was it, everything. Impact? Yeah. What is truly the impact of $10 a week to a 22 year old? It's a coffee nowadays. It's nothing. It's nothing. In a, okay. in a, where does 10 bucks go? It is right. literally a coffee nowadays. But if you put it and dismiss it, it's in that fund. It's just That's part right. of your expenses. Right. Right. And you forget that it's there. You don't, you know, go to it on a rainy day. It's, it's there for the thunderstorm down the road. You know, however, that we do speak about, please live in the now, don't only live for your retirement. But, you know, what you're doing is a precaution, just like you would with a medical insurance, a car insurance. You know, it's the insurance for later on to ensure that you actually can afford to live. You know, I'm one of those seniors that didn't have any of that. I'm going to be working until I drop, you know, for until I can't see or hear or speak anymore. And that is because we certainly were not taught anything about retirement, RSSPs, which here in Canada. And then there was a whole load of controversy about that and what they were paying out. And yeah, I wish I had known earlier that, you know, just a little aside um, and forget about it put it aside and forget about it and just let it build. You know, you mentioned a cup of coffee. We did a study, a little illustration. We said, well, you know, if you go to Starbucks and order a couple of uh, Grand Cafe mochas with whipped cream a week, two two coffees a week. Now, I'm not saying forego the coffee. Right. Who thinks about the investment in those two cups of coffee? But if you allocate the same amount of money to those two cups of coffee, we said a 35-year-old, at a 7% rate of return, retiring at age 65, those two cups of coffee end up on a weekly basis being over $111,000 more in your retirement nest egg, those two cups of coffee. Yeah. It's not a lot. It's not a big commitment. There's no impact on today 
really versus what the impact, the positive impact would be for tomorrow. The other thing we don't think about, and let us look back into the past, you know, when we were in our 20s and 30s, the cost of living was so much lower. And we look at where it's at today. And as I said, inflation on inflation, you know, it's just growing and growing the inflation, but the income uh, and the affordability is just, is not growing along with it. And it's, it's really, really hard just to kind of, you know, so many people now can't afford housing, especially here in Canada mm -hmm. and especially where I live, you know, a, a Pondocky house is a million dollars. Um, and it's, everything is, feels out of reach for people. And because that inflation rate is just going up so, so fast, and we're looking at your social security, that ain't going along with that inflation. So what do you do? It, it's, you know, I, I, I am glad I am where I am at this point and already mm. navigated much of the journey, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, one of the problems is that, you know, you need such a down payment to yeah. buy that starter house now. I mean, yes. I, believe it or not, the first condo I bought in the Boston area was $43,500. I took a mortgage out at 17%. Wow, that was high. Okay? I happily refinanced at 13%. Mm -hmm. Right now, on my house, many years later, I'm paying 2.875. But re the interest rates and inflation were much higher yeah. back then than they are now. Yeah. Even with this quote unquote, transitory inflationary blip that we've got right now. So the problem is that rents have yes. gone so astronomically. Ridiculous. E even if you don't have the down payment for mm -hmm. a house, the impact on your current cash flow to rent. I just heard of a friend of mine, his daughter uh, just rented a condo in the North End, the wonderful North End in Boston, a, a, a Italian ghetto. It, it's just wonderful. 700 square feet, right in the heart of the North End, $2,700, 700 square feet. It's yeah. crazy. My daughter pays 1200 a month for a room. Yes, yes. Right. For a room. Crazy. Yeah. But, you know, the answer is for many of the kids, you know, they end up living with other friends. And yes, friends. I'll go back home. <laughs> but oh, dear Lord. No, but, <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm uh, living in the rooms. I haven't got anywhere no. to come back to. <laughs> no, no, no. I just had everybody come back for two months. I was so glad to see them. Leave. <laughs> um, but, you know, what happens when you start a family? And yes. You can no longer co-op with everybody. Right. Else? And you need your own. It's tough. It's difficult. I, you know, uh, I empathize for them. But as I tell my daughter, as years go by, you're, she's now in her mid thirties. I said in her twenties, you're going to struggle. And I said, you know, when you get to your thirties, you're going to struggle more. And when you get to your forties, eh, you're still probably going to struggle. And when you're finally in your fifties, you may see the light for the end of the tunnel. So get used to it. Mm -hmm. You know, we all did it. You know, there's no, you know, silver bullet, magic yeah. bullet. It's not there. We all have worked very, very hard. Some of us have had more opportunity than others. Some have leveraged it, some haven't. But every, as a friend of mine said to me years ago, everybody's got a story. And yeah. you just got to deal with it and you move yeah. on and you make the best of it. You know, we ask people to have time management. You know, we ask them to have, you know, a management over their, you know, over their lifestyle, management over their health. Well, management over the money seems to be one topic that everybody is like, ah, la, 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 with. And I think it's because it's daunting. If you're not good with numbers, if you're not, you know, financially apt, which I'm not, you know, you talk finances to me and it's, the, you know, do, 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 no, it's just, you know, out there. Um, it can be just too much for people. And, you, you know, you talk about the financial institute where you go to people and you start talking about preparing for your retirement and they start talking in this dialogue that mm. goes over your head. And it's like you just sit there trying to look like you're intelligent and you haven't got a word of what they've said. And you well, walk out of there feeling rather intimidated. So I'll, I'll deal with that in a couple of different ways. So I watch the Bloomberg channel every once in a while. 
And I look at some of these folks and realize, and I'm in the business. I've been doing this for 33 years. I don't know what in God I'm talking about. The words and the terminology, yeah, I know. this and the, I'm in the business and I have no clue, okay? <laughs> now, take that from this male-dominated mm. people, talking to the women who need to be educated. And for years, years, the males continued to talk, as you say, above the heads, yeah. over in their own language, with their own terminology. From their own ego. <laughs> and never truly connect no. with their women. And I will tell you this. I have two designations in this industry. One is a CFP. I'm a certified financial planner. And the other is unique. I have a DAD. I was the father of a daughter. And I learned more from my daughter and how to communicate and connect with her while she was growing up, realizing that we were on two different planets and what (laughs) she was saying wasn't necessarily what she was thinking. And I had to figure all that out and then come back to her and respond in such a way that we could get to the next day. And I took those lessons to heart and I've learned how to communicate with my clients, which is why about a third of my clients are what we call suddenly single women, because we can connect with them. We don't talk in this garbage language that nobody understands. Where you feel like you're being talked down to. For my own ego. Exactly. These words that nobody knows what the heck I'm talking about. Not even me. (laughs) So, you know, I think it's really important that... um, we, we figure out how to make that connection because you as females outlive us as males. The statistics show it's six or seven years, but the reality is it's closer to 15 or 16 years. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you're sort of taking into the fact of divorce and how many women who just choose to be single. You know, being there in that hurricane, not going back, you know, and it's like now I'm single, but I can reach a certain age where I'm not employable or I've now got to go into employment, you know. So, yeah. Right. So we have to figure out how to dole out that information in such a way that it's comprehensible, that it's little pieces that we help to inform and instruct and guide people without bias. Yes. I mean, that's a problem. But, you know, for those of us who have done this this long and we don't need to look at people as cash registers, right? Right. Are you going to make for me? Yes. Uh, It's about you. And we have to figure out how to communicate in such a way that it makes everybody better. You know, since we last spoke, I've actually invested in cryptocurrency. And it's 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 one of these ones that actually, instead of sp- placing so much money on advertising to get people to join, they've rather invested in the people that join by tripling their money that they put in. And then um, uh, I think it's 16 months or 20 months or something, then you could start drawing out and whatever does get drawn out, you put back in and it keeps accumulating. I know that it's I look at it as part of my retirement money. I can only put in a, a small amount. If I get more, I can put in more. But it's, I'm looking at it as some way or other, it's going to be part of my, my security, my retirement, if I ever do, you know, later on, because it is too late for me to put the $10 a day away at 67, right? So for a lot of people I know that are in my situation that have social security, you know, pensions and things like that. And with the inflation going up, which is way higher than the money they're bringing in, it really has become a social problem, hasn't it? An economic problem amongst people who are managing their lives and now just simply can't. So let's talk a little bit about inflation and social security and the connection between the two. So the reality is since COVID, since the pandemic, Mm -hmm. And the supply shortage issue, Mm. the labor shortage Mm. issue, Um, you know, so we own, you know, a a nice little boat. It's a 24 footer. And uh, I don't know from boats, but my wife grew up on boats and she trailered boats when she was her family. She and her two brothers and the dog and mom and dad all would spend two weeks at a pop 
on the boat. Mm-hmm. Okay, which I don't even comprehend. I'm six foot five. I t- <laughs> any more than two of me on a boat, I, I, I guess I, you know, I, I can't do it. But the you know the five of them and the dog. Would mm-hmm. all be, she she's about the boat person. So we have a boat. So we had a problem, and we needed to get some power steering fluid. So we went to the local store and went in and typically they have 12 to 15 different providers of power steering fluid. They had one, one. And she's looking to try to figure out how to restock and couldn't. And, you know, this goes to everything. I, yes. I, I play golf. So my wife boats, I play golf. Uh, one of my golf clubs broke. I was looking to get a shaft for the club. It was a, get this, a one year wow. backlog. Yes. For particular shaft. And okay. this is a domino effect all around the world, this isn't is, it? This is yeah. happening. We're, we're hearing and seeing in, in yes. supermarkets and grocery stores, shortages, and therefore the prices are going up. Yeah. And this is what is leading to this inflationary um, period that we're in. The Bloomberg channel, we'll call it transitory, right? Mm. What does that mean? Hopefully it means that we have it here. It'll be around for another year. You know, hopefully we get through it and figure it out in a year. You know, the whole thing with, you know, the chips, you know, that are out there, not the potato chips, but the (laughs) chips that we need in our technology. Um, It's just driving prices up. Yes. Used car prices, you know, automobile prices, they're skyrocketing because of the demand, the lack of inventory, lack of parts, et cetera. So inflation is up and that's, a bad thing for those who are particularly on fixed income, Yeah. Um, particularly for those who were looking for in their investments, income from their bonds, mm. because there is no longer any income from their bonds. Right. It's close to zero. So the silver lining is that just last week, the Social Security Administration announced the cost of living adjustment, the COLA for 2022. And it's based on a particular inflationary uh, benchmark called the CPIW. And for the first time in 39 years, it was announced that we were going to get the biggest increase in 39 years of 5.9% for next year. Now, that's remarkable because if you take a look at about the last 15 years or so, We've averaged about one and a half percent per year. And we've had three years where we had zero cost of living. There were two years back to back, first time ever. So the silver lining is those on fixed income or those relying on Social Security will be able to have an increase um, that is very good. But you have to look at, at it in real terms because over the course of you know, the next year or so, there are going to be sectors that you know, of our economy and our industry that are going to go up significantly in terms of what your needs are. We, we're we hearing, again, toilet paper and yes. paper towels, not because people are hoarding them. Right. They're just not available. Right. Right. And therefore, prices will go up. It's called supply and demand. And look at the gas so, in, uh, in the UK. Right. Yep. So, you know, it, it's it's a complex time. I'll, I'll tell you a, a great story. It's, it's my father-in-law. So he, he is 89 years old. <clears throat> he retired at the age of 53. He was in the rags business and he made a good amount of money on a particular print back when he was 50, 52. <clears throat> and he retired. And all he wanted to do was play tennis the rest of his life. So he's been playing tennis seven days a week. He's 89. He's still playing tennis. He's commissioner of the league. He puts his league together both up here in Massachusetts and in Florida. Unbelievable, right? But since he was 53, the only thing he had ever invested in were municipal bonds. They had a good interest rate. They were tax-free. And he just kept clipping the coupons. He loved them so much. He told his three kids they should be investing in municipal bonds and his grandkids they should be investing in municipal bonds. And he and I sort of went toe to toe a few times. <laughs> that's not necessarily the right thing for the, for the younger generations. A few months ago, we were having uh, lunch at the Cheesecake Factory and we were chit chatting. And he says, I'll tell you something. I just had some bonds that matured. 
And it's the first time since, since I was 53 years old that I put that money into a basket of dividend yielding stocks. And he hadn't been in the stock market for 36 years. Mm -hmm. Whether that's right or wrong, he, he's managed to make yeah. it a good living and he's enjoyed the journey. But he said, I'm getting good dividends now, you know, three, four percent versus the zero to one percent mm -hmm. that you collect on the fixed income. It's a real problem. And particularly as inflation is having an impact yes. on us and the real nominal value of our income now, as we lose money to inflation, if our income's not going up, people are having to rethink how they're investing right now. Or even uh, how they're spending. I mean, you know, we everything relies on people having the money to purchase because uh, you know you, you need to purchase for people to be able to maintain their own business and everything right. is that cycle you know you right. have the money you go and buy the food you go and buy the clothes you go and buy this you go and buy that and that yep. generates the income for those people and vice versa if they haven't got the income they're not going to be purchasing and right. if they're not purchasing now those people are going to go under or struggle because nobody's purchasing because they can't afford it right but the mistake people make is they look at where we are today and project where we are today that it'll go for many, many years. And that's that's not the case with the stock market. That's not the case with inflation. That's not Jenny, the inflation once it's gone up, never comes back down again. Look at oh, gas yeah, I, prices. I think, I think here in, in the US, I mean, you're, you're seeing, you know, at 5.9% on that particular inflationary index, you won't see that again for several years after this, because we're, we will come back down to, in my opinion, mm -hmm. you know, that two to 3% number that I think, you know, that the feds are looking at in terms of their normal world. Um, and I think, so I think this is a blip. Um, I think it's a one year deal. It was really just taking a Polaroid snapshot of mm -hmm. what happened in the third quarter of this year. That's how they come up with their formula. Um, so they, they took a look at the first quarter. We had a sense of what the second quarter was. Third quarter was probably going to be very similar, and it was. Um, you know, we're going to see this probably go on, but my guess is by third quarter of next year, when we redo cost of living for 2023, I just don't think we're going to be anywhere near this at that time. So, you know, it's it's not so much where we are now because people do tend to project out where we are and last forever. You know, stock market will either never go continue to go up or, oh my God, it's going to continue to go down forever. And neither of one of those ever happens. Yeah, I guess because what I find, uh, like you were down. talking about, you know, per people purchasing or people renting, just looking at the, the 41 years I've been, or 42 years I've been here in, in Canada, um, the prices go up in rent, the prices go up in house. If the prices come down a wee bit because of interest rates in the buying, it never comes down in the rent. Never. And we have a, a rental shortage here right now because people can't afford. Right. So, right. you know, people are moving out more to rural areas and yep. um, and working online because they can't afford to work in the cities anymore. But you, yep. I've never, ever seen rents go down when the inflation right. has settled. So right. that is a right. huge problem for people. Yeah. You know, it's all about getting prepared. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and, you know, as, as you know, I, I did my fourth book last year, mm -hmm. uh, Don't Outlive Your Money in Retirement. And we developed a quiz within that book for those who, you know, are thinking about retirement. If anybody wants to go on any of your listeners want to go yeah. on to the quiz site, it's www.retirenowquiz.com. That's retirenowquiz.com. It's, it's a simple 15 question mm -hmm. uh, quiz, two minutes we tell people to invest two yeah. minutes in yourself. And then once you score, once you um, finish those questions, we'll immediately score which area, which, how prepared you are for retirement, which one of the three stages of retirement preparedness you're in. I'll also get you a free chapter of my book and a couple of worksheets so that you have a little bit more clarity in terms of what it is you need to do and how are you on track or not on track. And if you're not on track to retire, what do you need to do to put yourself closer to it? Right. Um, so offering that to your listeners. If you great, want. which is, you know, wonderful. And I said, I want people to go back and listen to the other show too, because you share a great deal of nuggets there as well. Um, you know, we, 
<clears throat> again, when people are young, they don't think about social security, they don't think about retirement, they don't think about age whatsoever. Everything is, you know, in the moment pleasure. And then my kids are all in their 30s and now kind of thinking about it. They've invested in a house together, which means all of my kids and my one daughter's husband have bought together as an investment, you know, to make money for the Airbnb, but also investment because properties here on the island since the pandemic have just gone up incredibly and won't be going down. That's for sure. Right, right. Um, so they look at it as, you know, investment in the property that they won't lose. And uh, even my one daughter who has nowhere near the kind of the income to put in, she's got 8%, but that 8% will grow. Right? Right, and she feels right. like she's got 8% invested in something instead of yep. just flapping out there. So, yep. you know, with the 10 bucks a day you can do, but there's, there's also so many other ways that you can actually pull together with people and say, okay, let's, Let's buy a piece of land because we know down the road it's going to be, you know, become a hot area. I mean, there are things that we can do if we're willing to think out of the box, but we do have to think about it. Well, you know, it's funny, and I, I, I'm not providing investment guidance or advice here, okay? But you mentioned you mentioned cryptocurrency. Right? Yes. Um, so very interesting at a number of different levels. Um, the millennials. You know, some of them have made, you know, significant money on crypto or some of these mean stocks, stocks like GameStop or mm -hmm. MC and, you know, all the headlines surrounding that. The, head, the other side of the headlines, are, there are a lot of people who lost a lot of money. In that. Yeah, so yes. You never see that. Um, but it, it, it has framed the expectations for younger investors in terms of what they're thinking of looking forward. Uh -huh. So there was a particular study that came out that showed that the millennials are now expecting a 17.8% return annually on their investments. Mm. Okay. That's an eye opener, right? Right. So let me bring it down to reality. I'm had my, uh, my daughter, stepdaughter, her husband, the 19 month old and the four month old all descended upon my house for two months. Okay. We had, it was wonderful to have the two little ones there. I couldn't wait to get rid of the pins. <laughs> um, I, I could go on for hours about that. One. However, we're sitting around the, the dinner table one night and I said to them, I wanted to start a 529 plan for the two little ones. And we were chit chatting about it. And my stepdaughter, um, who's very bright in a lot of areas, we call her a genius, but that's sarcastic because there are some areas she has no clue. Um, do you know that she can't read a clock unless it has numbers on it? Mm. She has no idea how to read a clock. That's our great educational system. But okay. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so I said to her, I said, think about it this way. Uh, there's the rule of 72. In other words, if you get 7% per year, your money will double in 10 years, okay? So assuming we put it in now and they need it at the age of 20 or 21, the money would double twice over that lifetime. However, rule of 72, if they earned 10% per year, it will double every seven years or it would double three times. Wouldn't that be great? And her husband looks at her and says, oh, I can do better than that. And I went, you know what? I won't mention his name. <laughs> I said, if you can do better than that on a consistent basis, what you need to do is be opening up your own money management firm because very few of them in the history of the financial world have been able to do consistently much more than that. But mm. that's, that's their expectation. Yeah. Just started investing. They, they made a lot of money, some of them, and they expect that to, to go on because they're geniuses and it'll happen. Well, that was the dot com era, right? too, right? Yeah, yes. Right. Yeah. And guess what happened after that? Stock market went down for three straight years. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some never learned their lessons. Um, so you can't get seduced by that stuff. You have to do it, you know, prudently. You know, you mentioned putting in a small amount into crypto. What do I believe crypto and as part of a portfolio, you ask? I hear all over, mm. all over the board, right? Um, I was just at a conference and somebody said, listen, I, I'd rather invest in my football picks than <laughs> invest in crypto, okay? And, I, and he said, I would have more fun doing it. I don't know. I do believe this, that crypto is here to stay. I'm not sure I under, completely understand it, but there are too many major financial institutions yes. 
opening up platforms to trade crypto, crypto is here to stay. Yes, it is. Value will be next year, the year after, 10 years from now, or what it's going to mean. But I think that for a very, very small percentage of your portfolio, may not be a bad idea to invest in something depending upon what your circumstance is. And again, that's not investment guidance. Um, but there are, you know, numbers of other diff- different things there that you can take a look at. You know, part of the, you know, you take a look at crypto, you take a look at electronic vehicles. Here's another mm-hmm. thing that, you know, is new. Um, the, the number I heard, and it was very interesting, 2% of all vehicles right now are electronic. 2%. Yes. It's the headlines, but it's only 2%, okay? Because that's where we're headed. Yes. That's where everything is moving. So do you figure out how to invest in some fund that does electronic vehicles or renewable energy or, you know, uh, at the internet or genomics, or there's a whole bunch of stuff that you could do for small amounts of money right. that could make an impact on your investing and in your future. Inflation or no inflation, you know, we have to look out 5, 10, 15, 20 years and recognize that, yeah, we have to get through today. But we've also got a plan for tomorrow as well. What do you say to people that are in my kind of age group, you know, 60s, 70s, that didn't save because, you know, for one reason or the other, that are living just on Social Security with the inflation and everything going up? You know what? Where I mean, I, you know, went and invested in this crypto. Um, my money immediately tripled. Um, I don't draw it out or do anything with it for a period of time. So it's kind of a long term investment. But we're looking for something that we can take a meager amount, a meager amount of our money and put it into something that isn't going to take 20 years to grow because we don't know if we're going to be around in 20 years, right? Well, I mean, what do we do? I'll approach that in a little bit different way, okay? Um, there was a recent study that came out, I think it was the January or February of this year. And this institute took a look at three different groups of people those with about forty or fifty thousand dollars or less of income on an annual basis, those in the middle, and then the 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 the, the top group, the quote unquote affluent group, um, had three hundred and twenty thousand dollars. So we're not talking about millions of dollars right. in this group. We're talking about mass America, if you will, the mass mass people. And the the study was trying to find out in these three different groups of people. Um, whether or not their, re- their retirement was in alignment with what their expectations were mm-hmm. for retirement. Okay, interesting question. Was reality in alignment with expectations? And how happy or satisfied were you with your now new chapter in life? Mm-hmm. And what they found with, with the top two uh, groups was that somewhere around 80% of the people were very satisfied with their retirement. It was pretty much in alignment with their expectations and they were enjoying whatever it is they wished to pursue in retirement. However, the difference between those two groups and the third group, where they only experienced about 35 to 40% were happy in retirement. The major difference was that that smaller, the the lower group was burdened by debt. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think, and again, I go back to the fact our industry has done a lousy job Mm. of educating people. They keep telling you, no matter what you have, you need to invest this money in blah, blah, blah. No. If you have debt, that is a stranglehold on you. The number one thing you need to do is get out from under it. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to pay off that debt before you put money towards savings or investing. Because if you've got 12, 15, 18% non-tax deductible interest on a particular item, and you've got five, 10, 15, $50,000 in debt, you are never gonna get out from under. Right. So. I think that the biggest thing that I can share with people as they approach approach retirement, for those who are struggling and can't get out from under, which means they more than likely puts a lot of stuff on debt, credit cards, loans, Mm -hmm. whatever, is to manage that properly. And by doing that, 
you could improve your cash flow on a monthly basis by hundreds of dollars a month, if not more. And either you know you can do it on your own or find a debt negotiation company or whatever. But you know sometimes you just have no choice but to put the money on the credit card, and I recognize that. But there's a lot of people where it's a behavioral or just a mm. non-literate way of doing things. You know, getting back to and here again, I digress. I apologize, but you know, when the kids go to college and the the, the credit card companies push their credit cards. Yeah kids with no knowledge whatsoever of what it means, except I can go downtown, I can put a bunch of beers and pizza on the credit card, and they never think about paying it back. You know, that's wrong. That's just wrong. Um, we need to teach people how to use the money that they earn now. It's what, you know, the greatest generation did. They, they didn't have credit card debt. They didn't have loans like that. They dealt with what they dealt with. And their emergency reserves were emergency reserves, yeah. not debt limits on credit cards. Right. So yeah. I think to answer your question, it's more about management of the debt. We all have to have some debt. There's good debt and bad debt, mm -hmm. right? Good debt is your mortgage, right? You have something that hopefully will appreciate over time. It's a much lower number two, three, four percent, whatever it is, and it's tax deductible. A good debt is a student loan debt, I believe, because you're investing in yourself. It's a six to seven percent loan. And hopefully you don't walk away with too much in the way of student debt, but it, it may be necessary. A bad debt is the credit card, mm -hmm. right? A bad, bad debt is the car loan. Unfortunately, most of us have to have a car loan because we don't have enough money to you know, buy it for cash. And I don't even like buying it for cash because it's a depreciating. Right. Right. The credit card is just lousy. It's going to blow up you know, our, our finances. So we really have to manage and understand the whole area of debt. Again, we do a lousy job of this, you know, helping with people. But there are organizations out there that are now trying to get this information out to make everybody a little bit more aware. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, just put it on your card, put it on your card. And then when the bill comes, ignore it, you know, um, <clears throat> instead I'm going to go out and put it on my card, you know, and then right. people take out another card because let's face it, they're constantly enticing you with cards at this right. interest rate, that interest rate. And it's so easy to get one nowadays. Uh, so it's and the interest rates really vary. Uh, so people don't realize about the interest rates on those things and that, yeah, you know, I only bought this much. That, but what's the interest rate on it? And then there's the interest on the interest. You know, so. And then you could pay double the amount that you paid for the yeah. actual product itself. Yeah. Like, yeah. No. So, you know, no. again, back to management, isn't it? It's like, you know, I used to, uh, you know, when I was working with my salary, a third would be my accommodation and bills. A third would be my living expenses and the other third would be put aside for either traveling or this or that or something. Right. But it's we don't manage our money. We don't look at our money. We just look at, oh, I've got the paycheck, pay the rent, you know, and off I go. And it's um, we you know, I think this has actually been a real shake up for people, even for the young people in this last 18 months, because they didn't have a job. It didn't matter if they were able to work, right? They, everything was closed down. And now going back, there are some jobs still open. We still have a certain amount of, not lockdown, but limitations here. Um, and it's not full force yet. So they've had a shakeup when it comes to, well, I can't just go out and get a good job or earn that kind of money. I've had to hold on to what I've got. I've had to restrain. I've had to look at finding my enjoyment elsewhere. And, you know, what if this happens again down the road? How do I put money aside that I'm going to be all right? So do you think it has been a shakeup for the young people? I think it's been a shakeup for a lot of people. And yeah. I, the, the, the backdrop uh, of writing my fourth book, um, which I said I would never do. Um, after my <laughs> never first say book, never. <laughs> I, I, I said after the first book, never again. After the second book, never again. And here I am, I reverend before. But the reason <laughs> I wrote it was as a result of the pandemic. Um, it was a glimpse into retirement. Mm. If you think about it, you had no work, no mm -hmm. work to go. You yeah. were stuck home with your spouse 24 seven. How did that work out? <laughs> um, thankfully I had an office to go to. Um, so it really gave people an insight into what that next chapter of life yes. was going to be like, and some embraced it. Um, many people had decided that, um, 
there were different priorities in life and many people um, moved their retirement date up earlier, mm. regardless of money. Right. Okay. Yes. And um, many people have yeah. happiness, satisfaction, yeah. joy, fulfillment. value of life. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Um, so I, I think it impacted a lot of people at a lot of different levels. But again, in my world, in the retirement world, um, it really was an eye opener for a lot of people. I have, you know, um, there's two big fears when it comes to retirement. One is, will I run out of money? OK. But the other is, and it's the conversation I have often with most of my colleagues, friends, and uh, clients, well, what do I do the rest of my life? Mm. Okay? You know, as a business owner, I have an identity. Yeah. I am the owner of this business. It is who I am. It's my baby. I built it. Um, it's what I do. It, it's what I bleed. I mean, th there's nothing else. You know, I've got my family. I've got my business. i got my golf. It's an identity. When yeah. I leave this, I lose my identity. When I leave this, I, I leave a community. When you've worked for an organization for many, many, many yeah. years, you're a respected part of that community. Right. You have structure. You have a reason to go into work, a reason to get up. It's so much more than just a paycheck. Um, I have a, a, a couple that are clients and they're in their early 70s. They have worked a lot for the town and that's how they've earned their income. One teaches at the university, the other, you know, has been part of one of the administrations and they're both going to retire finally. And I said to him, so what kind of keeps you up at night when you think about this? He said, well, I know I can play golf like three or four times a week, but I'm not sure what I do the rest of my mm -hmm. And I turned to her. And I asked her the same question. So what keeps you up at night as you look into this next chapter of life? She says, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with him. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes. I married you for better or for worse, but not for lunch every day. <laughs> so, you know, it, it, it's whether you have money or don't have money, that is really underlying what will fill us in terms of fulfillment, yeah. reward, et cetera. If, you know, I've got a YouTube channel, it's Your Retirement Authority, okay? Your Retirement Authority. And we have just done two or three videos, one of them particular, the difference between rich and poor, mm -hmm. okay? And believe it or not, the majority of the video, short video, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 minutes or whatever, the majority of that video dealt with perspective and how people lead their lives. That again, this industry does it wrong. It says, if you have a million dollars, you're better off with the per than the person who has 500,000. And if you have $10 million, you're better off than the person who has only $1 million. Wrong. That has nothing to do with the joy of life. It has nothing yeah. to do with happiness or satisfaction. So we need to talk to people. Yes, money is important and finances are great to take yeah. off the table in terms of an issue, but it's the rest of life that we need to deal with. Well, we want to still know we're purposeful, right. that we can still can right. contribute. I mean, right. uh, numerous amount of people I interview um, you know, are doing what they're doing now because they absolutely love it, they're passionate right. about it, and right. it's less to do with the money and more to right. do with the reason getting up every day, a right. feeling of fulfillment, of making a difference, so the joy of what they're doing, and pretty well radically different to what they did as a career. Right. You know, they're finally right. doing what they really always wanted to do. So, well, I, you, know, you know, I'm very fortunate I could retire tomorrow, okay? Mm -hmm. But the reason I do what I do is because every day I get to talk to my clients mm -hmm. and we talk about life. Yeah. We have such... There's such great storytelling going on. I can't tell yeah. you. Yeah. Um, I love that. You know, if, yes. if I talk to a client for a half an hour, three minutes is on money management and the rest of it is on life. Exactly. Exactly. So much fun because we've got so much to share. Right. You know? so, That's the reason why I do this. Right. You know, and not only right. is it a wonderful information for people, but it's right. also an invitation for people that every story right. matters. Right? right. And that we've all got something to say and, and, con and contribute and that, you know, please do not live by this illusional, static, um, 
dictation of what we're meant to do with our lives. You know, 2.2 kids, picket fence, retire at 65, do this, do that, do that. No, life is of your making. Your joy is of your making. Your purpose is of your making. Just go out and seize the day. I live with an 88-year-old. We've just come back from Montreal. I, I was having a hard time keeping up with her because it's her city. And she wanted to show me this and show me. And I said, we don't have to see everything in one day. And it's just the sheer joy of, oh, I went to school there or I did that there and I did this here. And seeing it through her joy, through her love, her passion of seeing her city. It was wonderful. And, you know, kind of almost childlike in, in her exuberance. We forget to be exuberant. Right. And it's like just because you've retired doesn't mean you're dead. This is the time to truly live freely and do what you really want to do. You know, you mentioned you've got your grandchild. I, I've got three of them. And, you know, as we were talking before the show was going on, you talked about how much joy and how ah. they're always smiling. Right. Yes. I mean, if we can just take a page out of that. Right. Simple joy in the moment, in the moment. Right here, yes, right now, yes. you know, the present. Yes. You know, so, you know, I, I have so much fun with, with my three grandkids because it's right there. Um, fortunately, the grandparent can, without the stress of being the parents, yeah. be able to enjoy that moment with the child. Th that is actually something I noticed when the very first time I held him. Oh, how different it felt. You know, when you first give birth and you hold your child, it's very authoric. And then, you know, I'm custodian of this child, you know, until it can spread its own wings. And you, you'll never stop. I'm, I'm known as mama wherever I go. My son's restaurant, I'm everybody's mama, you know. And it's a role I took very, very seriously and was still very, very tight by my kids and I. But when I first held my grandson, it was just such a wonderful sense of peace because now I could truly you know, love this child and pour everything else into this child because I'm not responsible for his daily living. <laughs> it is a very different thing. And it's, it's sort of like, right it's, sort of like <laughs> it's sort of like renting versus owning. Yeah. My kid's yeah. back, right? Well, you know, a little while ago he had a fall and he cried away like crazy. And it's, you know, the first fall and the kids were like, oh, you know, end of days. And <laughs> and he had this cry. I said, let him cry, let him cry. And they, I said, you know, do we have to take him to hospital? Let him cry. And they turned around at me and just smiled. And I said, he's fine. <laughs> because they are, you know, I'm hurting right now. I'm going to cry because I'm hurting. I'm not hurting anymore. You know, what can we do now? And that's the, such a tip that we can take out of, of, of ch grandchildren, but of the animals in the world or even of nature. The nature yep. is very, very present in the now. Yeah. If it's suffering from drought or if it's suffering from floods or if it's, you know, growing beautiful flowers, we forget to live in the now. Now, that doesn't mean we can't prepare. Correct. And Correct. if we prepare rightly, if we, if we really do our due diligence, it means we're going to enjoy so many more nows in our right. lives without the anxiety. And the more informed we can get them, again, I'll, I'll reference your listens, listeners back to you talk about preparedness, the quiz. It's retirenowquiz.com. Um, we'll score that for you. Get yeah. your chapter and some worksheets and, you know, start to, through that questionnaire, through that quiz, we'll start to ask you questions you may not realize you mm -hmm. need to ask. It's interesting. I tell the story of when my daughter was about 14, we were living, uh, she was a singer. And my last name is Singer. Good thing it's not Dancer because she was singing. <laughs> and... So she was going to walk a quarter of a mile to the local train station to go north to the choir rehearsal uh, up, up in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And it was the first time she was ever going to do it alone. So she walks to the train station. She gets on. The train is moving. People are around her. The conductor gets up, comes up to her, asks her for her ticket, gives the conductor the ticket. And the conductor says, I hope you have a good time in Boston. Well, the problem with that sentence was Boston was the southbound train. Oh, she no. was supposed to be on the northbound train <laughs> to Gloucester. So she didn't know. She, right. The train was moving. People were on it. Yeah. It looked like it was, should be very familiar. We've all, we've all done it in some form or other, right? <laughs> yeah. She didn't even know the question she didn't know. That's the point, isn't it? And, and yeah. we are, if you, if you think about your journey, and particularly the financial planning journey, 
every time we seem to ask a question, the answer prompts six more questions. Yes. Right. We're overwhelmed. We go, yeah. eh, I'm not going to do it anymore. It's all noise, blah, blah, yeah. blah. blah. Um, yeah. But yeah. You're going to get somewhere. If you don't take control of it, you may find that you're on the southbound train yeah. when you should have been on the northbound train. Right. Yeah. So you're headed in a, in, to, towards a destination. You, you, you need to figure this out. You need to understand this is all going to happen. You need to do time management, prioritize, figure what's right and wrong. You know, the, 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 the analogy I use is of a juggler, okay? Everybody's trying to juggle everything mm-hmm. at once. But we need to give people the green light to say, no, you know what? Some things you don't have to deal with right now. Some things you do, some things you don't. And the key to the financial planning process is just identify what it is you need to do and then put some time frame on it. You know, today I need to do with this. Well, this is really important, but I really don't need to deal with that for another two years. You know, um, you know, on the financial planning journey, whether it's debt or emergency reserves or college savings or putting money away for vacation or a home improvement project or retirement or whatever it is, you can't deal with all these things at once. Right. So you and your spouse, if you have one, you, you sit down and you prioritize what's important to you. And that becomes the basis of your financial planning. It's nothing more more than that. Don't make it more difficult than that. And don't make, make it an argument, please. Because oh, right, especially right, right. with a spouse, the, the argument over money has destroyed so many marriages. Exactly. You know, and it's like, I think, come to the table, both of you, writing down your concerns. Yep. Right? Writing down yep. ideas, what you think. And no idea is stupid. And then yep. share what you've both got and have an open conversation. This isn't about one-up and shit. Yeah. Right. Because money arguments are really marriage destroying. Unfortunately, you are you are accurate. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I I don't know this as a statistics, but I'm sure that it's close to, if not the number one reason for divorce. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, And and if it's not one, it, 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 it when you find yourself in financial duress, it uncovers other areas and it becomes stress all over and then you get divorced. Right. And a word of warning to everybody, never, 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 never put a dollar sign on somebody. They yes. are not a dollar sign. Yes. Their value yes. and their worth is so much more than a right. dollar sign. So right. please never refer to people as a dollar sign. Or you're only bringing in so much or you're only worth that. Right. So that is yeah. a one way downward spiral. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's all about proper perspective, right? Yeah. And, and like, like, like as you said, it's never too early. You know, right. if you've got grandkids, get them in that, you know, pre- preparation. Basically, a lot of people kind of look at putting money aside for education. Right? This, this pandemic was a perfect opportunity, yeah. actually, by the way, because the kids were home. Yes. Okay. So give them chores. Mm-hmm. Have them put away $5 a week. Yes. Catch them. Yes. Okay. Put it into some account somewhere to see it grow. And they could see it grow. Then when they have enough money, call it $200 or $250, then you put it into some sort of investment vehicle because you could do it for that short money and give them the opportunity to experience right. what the market is at an early, early stage. See that it goes up, see that it comes down, yeah. have fun with it. Guess what? you will not become the ATM yes. for your kids later on. Right. The most joyous conversations I ever have with my daughter is when she doesn't ask for money. Right. Yeah. She just called to say hello. Yes, exactly. You must exactly. be needing something. No, I just called <laughs> to say hello. I'm not going to have this conversation. And, and the other thing too, the, the big V word, value. They value money better. They, they value people, I think, you know, by being able to see older. You know, when they see somebody who's older that can't afford this and can't afford that, and well, I don't want to be that. I must make sure that I, I'm secure in the future. But they also then have a little more empathy and compassion for people who are that because nobody showed them how to, to save for, for that. You know, it was always saving for the rainy day, but it was never saving for the retirement because most of the time you paid into that in the company that you worked with. If you're a business owner, you have to set up a number of different things that you've got to take care of. Marketing, 
cash mm -hmm. flow, payroll, um, inventory, whatever it is, you have to have a plan. Why do we not look at our own personal yes. situation as something that we have to develop a plan for? Right. We have it for our business. Why in God's name do we not have it for our personal? This is the plan for college. This is the plan for retirement. This is the plan for saving. We, we need to deal with that in the same way that we would build a business. And we don't, we don't think that far because it's, and especially in a world right now of instant gratification. You know, um, your Instagram, which is just instant in the moment and people are glued to it and they're glued to TikTok and they're glued to this and they're glued to that and they're under the illusion that that's what the world is really like and they're not living in the real world. So if we can actually introduce the kids very, very early into the responsibility of life, of maintaining a life, you know, what happens if you get sick? Um, we don't know what's down the road for us. There's a certain amount of prevention we can do with health, you know, with soul and spirit, with money. There's a lot that we can do, but we don't know what's coming, right? And But we want to be prepared for whatever does come that at least how many people do I know that have had cancer, lost their job, had no money, couldn't afford the treatment, you know, and there they are, you know, having cancer, going through this and, and no way to sustain themselves. That's dreadful yep. that is absolutely mm -hmm. dreadful but the numbers are high yep no doubt about it so i mean you you have to be accountable for yourself yeah. you have to do your own research and due diligence you can't rely on other people even if we i just had this conversation with somebody uh, earlier um they have a financial advisor and they weren't where they thought they were mm -hmm. and you know, you can't place that blame on the advisor alone. No. You are part of that relationship. Yeah. You, yes, you want to rely upon, yes, you want to trust them, but it has to be, you have to invest of your own time and be accountable for the questions that you ask as well. Um, and so you've got to be learned. You've got to be financially aware at some level. I'm not going to put you on the Bloomberg channel so you can repeat back to me those words. I have no clue what they're talking about in their bow ties, but you still have to be accountable. You just can't pawn it off or delegate it out to someone else. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's the same. Well, if you are going to be uh, investment in stocks or you have a trader, you still got to be on top of it. Because now you, you know, you're know you relying on them. If, if it goes wrong and you lose all your money, you blame them. But where was your responsibility? Where's your accountability? And you know, it takes a moment to look. Oh, I don't like where they're going. Talk to the trader. Should we sell? Should we this? Should we that? You know, we have to be on top of things. So the other thing is don't take on more than what you can manage. And I think you know, management is key in everything we do in life. Our time management, yep. our money management, our health management, our everything management, relationship management. And very often people just find themselves too spent. I'll deal with that later. And then later comes along and it's like, oh, shoot, I should have dealt with this earlier. Yeah. Yeah. When is the new book going to be ready? It's out. It is. It is out. <laughs> Okay. Don't outlive your money in retirement. Seven key steps. You can find it. Um, Is that the third book or the fourth book? That's the fourth. That's the fourth. I hope there's never going to be a fifth. I'll, I'll <laughs> he you, says, he you says. You heard it first. <laughs> um, you can find it on our uh, website, which is www.55retire.com. That's www.55retire.com. Dot com. You can find it on my YouTube channel as well, Your Retirement Authority. Um, had a lot of fun with it. Tell some, some good stories in it. Um, try to provide as much guidance as possible and to help people be more financially aware as they prepare for retirement. Right. And of course, you, you know, please take the quiz, retirenowquiz.com, because that at least gives you the gauge of where you're at and also helps you put those questions together of what you need to know or what you want to know and how to move forward. Right, right. And of course, you're on Facebook, 55 Retire. You're on LinkedIn under Mark Singer, uh, CFP. And you're on Twitter, 55 uh, Retire. 
And so people can reach out to you in any which way. Okay. We are here. You're right. We are here. And I'm not writing that fifth book. You've heard it again. <laughs> Until you're back for the fifth book. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know what? It's, it's, um, it's always great having you here. I mean, you know, money has always been something for me that has completely been rather intimidating. Um, you know, I've always kind of, you know, worked for my money day to day. Uh, and then in my marriage, we invested and then that all went south. And uh, I even invested in electric motor technology and uh, that went south. And so it's like I've tried, but, you know, it just always went south because I think when it came to the money side of things, it was all above me. And yeah, I mean, I tried talking to financial people and they just made me feel stupid. Yeah, and like, good. well, you know, you've got to put 10,000 in. I don't have 10,000, you know, <laughs> and it's like, and it's like, well, why don't you have 10,000? You know, and like, you know, you're less than, and right. it's like, right. you know, can I put in 50? And they don't want yeah. to deal with you, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And I think that is, especially with, with people even 50 plus that haven't done all of that preparation, they need to know what they can do now because they can't afford to live at the rate that they are right now. So any tips that you've got for them, please reach out to you and uh, read the book, listen to the YouTubes, um, but you're happy to speak to them, aren't you? Absolutely. That's what I'm here for. Great. And you're, you know, a, a compassionate, sensitive ear with a lot of practicality, which is what is needed because we just don't want to be made to feel small. Right. And that is important. And also, you may retire from that career, but that doesn't mean it's over. Now you can go and really start something you really want to do. And believe me, it's illuminating. I've been doing this nine years now. I love it. I love it till I'm going to do it until I can't do it anymore. So there's always something out there that's going to elongate your life and keep you busy. And it may not be full time. It may be part time. It doesn't matter. Find something that's meaningful, that gives you a purpose and that you enjoy, because this is the time to do it when you retire, isn't it? Here, here. <laughs> thanks so much, Mark. It's been a delight having you back on here again. Sarah, thanks for having me. Always, anytime. Ah, the money question, folks. Stitch in time. If you're young, listen to this right now, or even if you're older and you've got grandkids, maybe start looking at putting something aside. He talked about something earlier, which you about an investment thing you were doing with your grandkids. Uh, Mark can help you with that. Um, and let's, you know, let's invest in the grandkids, uh, even your own kids that you think, uh, you know, aren't putting the money aside. Talk to them about it because. We really do need to look at our longevity. And when we're younger, we don't. So let's get the ball going. We want to see everybody safe and sound as they get older and not be worrying about it, right? Correct. Okay, folks, until next time, this has been another great show on finances. And remember, business isn't just about business. It's about the business of your life. So next time, see you then. We hope that you enjoyed the show. You will hear many, many shows here on selfdiscoverymedia.com. We have new shows for you out every week. Just find them on our podcast or, or what's new. If you feel that you have something to share that makes a difference in the lives of others, or you too feel that you could be a host, please contact me at info at selfdiscoverymedia.com and we will be glad to speak with you. Have a wonderful day.